my talk today is part of a larger project focused on mapping the unknown and I choose this uh, study case about the southern continent because among many other uh, Renaissance terrain cognitae, the Austral continent or Quinta Pars offers a singular case by which to examine the creation of knowledge about unknown lands because since no material demonstration could have explained its cartographic depiction for the reason that the Quinta Pars simply did not exist, also because most of the evidence for its existence was merely plausible conjectures. This case uh, allowed us to analyze the philosophical conceptions, the epistemological basis, the validating procedures, and the intellectual methods involved in imagining and representing unknown geographies. And more important, its inexistence will allow us to analyze these factors while avoiding the temptation to compare this with reality and thus to try to measure errors or inaccuracies. If I here, um, I prefer to refer to the Terra Australis as Quinta Pars, although this was not the most used name for it, is it is first of course, because this toponym in fact appears in many sources of the time, and second, because more important indeed, because it made part of my argument. After having accidentally discovered the new world I mean, by Europeans, also called Quarta Pars, as we can see in this quote by Jerónimo de Chávez, a Spanish cosmographer, the common belief was that a fifth part might appear sooner or later. My presentation today uh, raises two sort of questions. On the one hand, it's about epistemological issues, the epistemological challenges that the Quinta Pars introduced into the Renaissance discourse of the unknown. Why has the general belief in the Quinta Pars qualified as geographical knowledge? What epistemological devices justified it? What were the conditions that rendered it this existence plausible? And on the other hand, the questions are about aesthetical components involved in representation of the unknown in mapping and maps. Uh, graphic patterns like colors and lines and shapes, iconography, toponyms, etc. I mean, how could an unknown and an existent but, uh, but very similar geographical object could have been mapped? My presentation is based on a primary premise. The emergence of the Quinta Pars was not an isolated fantasy, nor is it explainable by its own nature or characteristic. I will argue that Quinta Pars required some condition of verisimilitude to render it possible, and the main condition of this verisimilitude was the new world. This is my itinerary today for my presentation. Uh, to understand why the Quinta Pars was imagined as a part, we need shortly explore how the Quarta Pars became a continent itself, um, despite the continent, as most of you know, especially Karen and, and Martin, is a very unstable and polysemic concept even today, but it proved to be very useful to develop my argument. Second, following that argument, I will say a few words about island and continents. And third and finally, by comparing the representation of both the fourth and the fifth part of the world, especially through observable aspects on maps that can bring us to think about intellectual strategies by which to configure the geographic unknown, I will be back to the main points. Why has the general belief in the Quinta Pars qualified as geographical knowledge? what epistemological devices justified it, and what were the conditions that rendered its existence possible. Um, to say shortly, first, uh, about how the Quarta Pars became a part itself, 
is because it was assumed that the new world was a new part, both due to its size and also because of its singular nature, very different from those in other parts of the world. And here the keywords are fourth part, greatness, as big as the old world, and very different from ours. However, humanists and scholars in the 16th century encountered some difficulties in trying to provide a conceptual framework to organize information about the newly discovered lands or Ptolemaic traditions because, and for explaining that, I will quickly mention something about islands and continents. The standard classification of lands, land masses, described in many cosmographies and other scientific books consisted of four categories, islands, isthmus, peninsula, and continents. The definitions used to be accompanied by examples and by this kind of diagrams. Obviously, it was a taxonomical classification. Any piece of land had to fit in any of these categories. This archetypical scheme, vaguely inspired by the Greek geography, as one can expect in the Renaissance, um, that is visible in the image on the left, appeared in manuscripts as well as in printed books, and also as part of larger pictures accompanying world maps, astronomical charts, cosmographical schemes, and others, all together reinforcing cosmographical concepts conceptions of the world as well. And here is a zoom of the Rosacho's map. America challenged the classification of land masses. There were no place for it. Sometimes it was included as a, an example of continent, sometimes appears as an example of islands, and sometimes it was completely absent as a symptom that the uncertitude of what the America was. So, after some decades, the preoccupation with finding a place for America in the geography of the world triggered a revised understanding of the idea of a continent. Uh, starting from a negative definition, a continent is everything that is not an island, it's more a peninsula, geographers progressively adopted a new criterion, that is, body of water will mark out the limits of each continent. And the bigger they were, the more effective they were. Paradoxically, <coughs> continents became sort of islands. As a result, and that was my main point to continue my argument, this new criterion, which actually served to delineate not only existing continents, but also future ones, made possible new parts, new continents, new additions, new worlds. To develop this point, I will remark four types of parallelism between ideas and images about the fourth and the fifth part to explain how the uh, new world, or quarta part, was the condition of verosimilitude between uh, uh, for the fifth part. First of all, um, the fifth part began to be imagined as human world humanists had learned about the new world. Henceforth, well from the beginning, the fifth part started being a continent separating from the others by bodies of water. Tierra del Fuego was uh, the geographical starting point for imagining the austral continent, and this is an early example about how Tierra del Fuego expands itself as a terra firma or continent to the limits of the maps. In this way, mm, the southern continent was hardly indicated as if it were the tip of an iceberg, and it is depths remained in the mystery, and it matches perfectly with the diagram of continent, as I showed before. In other words, uh, the southern landmass has a truncated continental shape as America used to appear in earliest maps. 
and again it's very similar with the usual scan that used to display the kind of uh, four type of lenses. So the lamas continue increasing its size, for example, including the, uh, the islands of Greater and Lesser Java. But later, when the insularity of Tierra del Fuego had been confirmed, the resistance to abandon the idea of the fifth continent at the French navigator Jean Alphonse expressed, mm, new geographical evidences were taken into account to build up a renewed austral continent and new data collected from explorations in the Southern Ocean were used interpret as empirical inputs to keep alive a hit Southern continent that might fit with European cosmographical expectations. And for instance, Iceland seen from far away and maps as dots on the map were joined by tracing a line to reinvent a new and unexpected Austral continent. This is a very interesting map because it's both geographical and conceptual. At the bottom, a map of Patagonia and Terra Australi, as it did say in the cartouche. But more, much more interesting, at the top, there is uh, also a map, a diagram, uh, we can call it in three different ways, but uh, it's emphasized the Strait of Magellan and the idea about the bodies of water as dividing parts suggested that the strait could transform this austral landmass into a continent. Uh, yes, that's a, a, a quotation by André Tevet as well, who stated that the Strait of Magellan divided the South American from the austral land unknown to us, unknown to them, in fact. The second aspect concerns the cartographical writing. In the first half of the 16th century, in early modern Spanish manuscript world maps, the so-called Patron Real, made by royal cosmographers and their assistant at the Casa de Contratación in Seville, the new world's outline took shape progressively in accordance with empirical information. Something similar appeared for the uh, unexplored regions for the southern continent beyond Tierra del Fuego. The, oh. the New World and the Terra Australis shared this graphic pattern, especially in the early modern period. Moreover, by comparing maps with texts, one finds some correspondence with the just mentioned theoretical debate regarding insularity versus continentality. In manuscript maps, incomplete and open lines were used to mean continent or terra firme, closed line islands. And even if this pattern is much more common in manuscript maps, we can also find it in printing copies. The third parallelism between the fourth part and the quinta part are the geographical shapes, something that is close to what Sultan explained before. Um, I add in something mm, slightly different. Uh, straight lines and geometrical shapes express the hypothetical status of geographical objects. That becomes evident when we compare cartographical images of known against unknown regions. As predictable for the new world, this geometrical pattern affected more the western coastlines in accordance to the unexplored regions in early modernity. Similar strategies were applied to depict Terra Australis. In the case of the New World, as well as that of the Terra Australis, the areas defined by straight lines usually were accompanied by legends such as Terra Incognita and other similar texts, which allows us to think the geometrical trace 
with the status of the unknown attributed to those parts of the world. The last point is about symmetry. The shape of unknown lands was also a product of the geometric notions of symmetry and balance, according to which the known hemisphere needed to be counterbalanced and even surpassed by the equivalent masses in other parts of the world. Gerard Mercator himself, stepped in the precept of physics, expected a new continent whose geometric proportions, weight, and size should be sufficient enough to counterbalance the effect of the other two parts of the world in another continent. And if I left to the end this concept or this issue of symmetry, it's because um, it, it serves to prove that it was not a fixed category, much more that was a device to reinvent the unknown geographies for the world. I'm not going to the sixth part, but I want to demonstrate that taking for granted the existence of the Terra Australis or the fifth part, a Terra Septentrionalis, somewhere also mentioned and as an expected sixth part, shows up in many maps adopting similar graphic strategies at both high latitudes. So here green is the color for the unknown landmasses, both in the northern on the continent as well as in the northern one. And the principle of geometry also mirror relations such as terra incognita in the north and in the south, and also mirror blank spaces. So the unknown was not only the result of the a projection from the known, but also the unknown itself was projected. This is the last map I will show you uh, because it's a beautiful example to show how the two of the items I, I, I developed. On the one side is a complete cartographical writing, both in the northern hemisphere and the south, and also the principles of symmetry apply to both. So um, my conclusions. Um, sorry. I need some final remarks. The first remark is methodological. A broad range of materials, especially scientific books, maps, histories and travel accounts made possible a different approach for a conceptual history of this subject. Images of various types and in various media, contrasted with definitions, verbal descriptions and theoretical arguments, are much more than simply illustrations. There are devices that interact with text and allow us a better understanding of, of an intricate process of the conceptual redefinition of continent as an effort to provide equivalent geographical status for the fourth part of the world and, and later to create the fifth and even the sixth part of the world. A conceptual approach in dialogue with these contemporary images reveals the importance of considering the visual culture in which maps were produced and circulated. The second remark is about the idea of the condition of verisimilitude applied to historical problems. In an epistemic sense, the quarter parts or new world seem to have been the condition of verosimilitude for the existence of the quinta parts because it allowed a rational evaluation of how close this fifth part was to the truth uh, on the basis of available evidence while no counterfact invalidates the theory, which actually just happened with James Cook's voyage by the end of the 18th century when he explored the Pacific Ocean and certificated that no Austral continent was there. And the third one, a very short remark, addresses the remarkable challenge of reflection about the unknown as a geographical category, and not just a, a, about the fact of the absence of knowledge. Part of the importance of thinking about it as an epistemological device relies on the conviction that the invention of unknown geographies says more about the known geographies and about our ways of creating knowledge about them 
than about the unknown lands themselves. Thank you so much. We continue our explorations of the fifth part of the world with our second speaker. And uh, some, for some of you, this may be a familiar face and a familiar topic because we had a lecture here last night on the same, uh, by the same speaker. So Chet Van Duzer is an independent scholar and his presentation is entitled Imagine Territories Around the South Pole, the Southern Ring Continent, 1515 to 1554. Thank you. Well, I'll just jump right in, uh, continuing our panel on the southern continent, this uh, mythical imaginary land in the far south. Uh, I'll begin with some thoughts on the early cartographic history of the southern continent. And uh, I'll begin with classical antiquity. So in the first century BC, the, the Roman statesman Cicero, uh, in his the dream of Scipio, suggested that the earth was arranged symmetrically and that there was habitable land in the southern hemisphere just as there was in the northern hemisphere. So these two symmetrical land masses in the north and south. And this idea was elaborated by Macrobius in his commentary on the dream of Scipio in the early 5th century. And there are maps based on Macrobius's text, of which we see an 11th century example here. And what we have, we can see if a few of the familiar uh, geographical details in the north, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. So the, the, the familiar land masses are sort of compressed into the northern hemisphere. And so we have Europe, Africa, and Asia. And then we have an equatorial ocean. And then we have the southern continent. And the, the southern continent has a temperate zone in the middle opposite the temperate zone in the north, and then in the, the far north and far south, we have uh, frigid zones, and then uh, very warm zones, the, the torrid zone, so-called, in the middle. And uh, this, there are many manuscripts that have similar maps, and the, these maps are also uh, in print. So we have the 1483 edition of the Commentary on the Dream of Scipio, which was the same scheme, so this is one of the uh, sources of early depictions of a southern continent. And then moving into the 16th century, we have Francesco Roselli's Oval Planisphere of 1508, which we see has a southern continent. Uh, we can't be certain that Roselli was influenced by Macrobius, but it, it seems eminently possible. And I'll just mention there are, f there are uh, I think it's six little city symbols in the southern continent, the little red uh, signs there, which is very intriguing. And so this, this idea of a ring continent, so instead of a large island, essentially, at the South Pole, on a number of maps and globes, we have a ring of land around the South Pole with open water at the pole. And I'd, I'd found these depictions to be very intriguing. And I'll look at three examples of them today. The first on Johann Schoner's globe of 1515. Uh, here's Schoner. He was a, a polymath, uh, astronomer, mathematician, geographer, cartographer, and teacher. Here is his globe of 1515. It's a printed globe. There are two complete uh, exemplars that survive, and then the Library of Congress also has some fragments of uh, the printed sheets of the gores of this globe. And here's the New World on Schoner's globe. And in this uh, same image, we can see a glimpse of his southern continent. And the, the presence of this southern continent on Schoenner's globe is, is interesting for a few reasons, one of which is that the globe was closely based on Martin Waldseemuller's famous 1507 map. Many, many of the details on the globe were taken from Waldseemuller's 1507 map, but as we can see, there is no southern continent uh, on Waldseemuller's map. And Waldseemuller also made a globe, so the, the 1507 map doesn't show the whole world. The globe does, and there's no southern continent on his globe either. If we look at uh, the southern polar regions on Martin Beheim's globe of 1492, we have this elaborate decoration of the symbols of Nuremberg, but no southern continent. 
This is the South Pole and the Lenox globe of circa 1510 at the New York Public Library. Again, no southern continent. So what we're seeing on Schoner's globe is unusual in the context of 16th century cartography. So here is a good look at the southern continent uh, on Schoner's globe. Again, it's a not complete, but a ring of land around the South Pole with open water at the pole. And we see the label Brasiliae Regio, so the region of Brazil, which is placed in the southern continent, which is surprising to say the least. I'm zooming in a little bit to see that place name more closely. And so here we have, uh, Sch Schoner published a pamphlet to accompany his globe called the Luculentissima Quaidam Terrae Totius Descriptio. And he has some text about the Brasiliae Regio in that pamphlet. Here's the beginning of the description. We can see the place name there. And what he says is that the land was discovered by the Portuguese, that it is not distant from the Cape of Good Hope, and that it runs east and west. And he also says that the inhabitants of the land wear untreated animal skins, use bows and arrows, have cassia and unusual birds, and abundant gold and silver. And clearly this part is, comes from a description of Brazil. But the part about this land in the south running east and west is certainly not Brazil. That part comes from a very ambiguous passage in uh, another pamphlet called The Tidings Out of Brazil, printed in 1514, uh, that talks about a Portuguese expedition in the south southern ocean that in encounters some land that seems to be running east and west, but it's very ambiguous. And this was Schoner's interpretation of this ambiguous passage. That's part of the source of his southern ring continent. But if we look more closely at the southern ring continent, it has some very intriguing features. It has these two huge lakes, each surrounded by mountains and joined by this very long river. And the pamphlet about this mysterious Portuguese voyage contains not a word about any such configuration of the southern continent. So the question becomes, how on earth did Schoner get the idea that there were these two lakes surrounded by mountains joined by a long river in this totally hypothetical southern continent? And we have to go back to one of the great geographical problems of antiquity, which was the flooding of the Nile. Why is it that the Nile floods in the summer when there is no rain uh, in Egypt? And uh, various theories had been put forward to account for that fact. Um, here is the Nile in flood in the summer of 1964. So again, this the, the, the Nile r routinely floods in the summer. Why, where does the water come from? Why should the river flood in the summer? One of the explanations of this was from Pomponius Mella, who wrote that, but if there is another world, and there are Antiquones, that is, inhabitants of the opposite world, opposite us across the equator, then even this would not be far removed from the truth that the river, the Nile, has its source in those lands, that is, in this southern continent, whence it penetrates beneath the seas in a hidden channel, then emerges again in our lands, and it is for this reason that it swells at the summer solstice because it is, it is then winter at its source. So the seasons in the southern hemisphere are the opposite. The Nile floods in the summer because it's there winter and raining at its source. And we can see a depiction of Pomponius Mello's theory on a 17th century map. So this is an attempt to represent the world according to Pomponius Mello. And just to orient ourselves a bit, Europe, Africa, and Asia, and then we have the southern continent. And if we zoom in, we can see we have the Nile in Africa, and then this equatorial ocean, and then another part of the Nile further south in the southern continent. And zooming in again, we see the Nile in Africa. The text says the source of the Nile in the other world. And we even have the mountains of the moon, the traditional Ptolemaic source of the Nile in this southern continent. Pomponius Mella doesn't specify that, so in this case, the 17th century cartographer has gone a little bit beyond what uh, Pomponius Mella says, but nonetheless, this map is very suggestive. So if we look back at Schoner's globe, we can note that one of the lakes surrounded by mountains is directly south 
of the Mountains of the Moon, the traditional source of the Nile. That, that location directly to the south is very suggestive. But why are there two lakes surrounded by mountains? Why are they joined by this long river? What I will suggest is that Schoner took a medieval depiction of a totally mythical western branch of the Nile and transferred that to his hypothetical southern continent. And that's where we get this curious representation, these two, river, this two lakes surrounded by mountains joined by a river. So on the Hereford map of Mundi, which I've reoriented so that we have north at the top, we zoom in a little bit, we, I can s we can see the Nile there, and then this, often it's often called the western branch of the Nile, which has this configuration of two lakes joined by a river. And that very similar depictions appear on other Mapaimundi. So here we have the Sali Mapaimundi of circa 1100. Again, I've oriented it with uh, north at the top, point out the locations of the continents. So we'll zoom in on southern Africa. And again, we have these two lakes joined by this river. And there's a, one other example I'll mention. So the, the, the Beatus Mapamundi in the saint Sever manuscript from the 11th century. Again, I've rotated it so that north is at the top. So here's the Nile. And we have this lake surrounded by mountains as part of the Nile system. So going back to Schoener's globe, again, this is this the same configuration. What Schoener has done, again, is, is he thought that the source of the Nile had to be in the southern hemisphere. He took this land that was suggested by this Portuguese pamphlet, and he added to it this medieval depiction of a branch of the Nile. So it's a very con curious construction of this southern ring continent. Moving on to my second example, I'll look at another southern ring continent in an anonymous world map in a manuscript of Ptolemy at the Vatican. And we have a beautiful facsimile of the manuscript in the case over there. Here is that world map, uh, probably painted in about 1530. Was that is to say, it was added to this manuscript of Ptolemy in about 1530. The manuscript itself dates from the middle of the 15th century. We can see that we have this very extravagant southern continent, this huge ring of land, in this case continuous, uh, with open water at the pole. And if you take a closer look at it, sort of piece by piece, uh, we can see that it is full of place names, I, even though it's actually labeled, if you the, the letters are spread across the bottom, but it's actually labeled terra incognita twice, and yet it's full of place names. In this section, we can see there are six cities, which is very curious. And then we have this peninsula jutting to the northeast that I'll look at more closely in a moment, and the eastern part of the continent. So I looked closely at all the place names in this southern continent, and most of them seem to be either invented or, or sort of pulled randomly from other places on the map. But this peninsula that juts to the northeast, uh, that's not the case there. Um, and we'll, so we'll zoom in on that now. And remarkably, the place names on this part, uh, on this peninsula, come from Columbus's fourth voyage. Which is a very strange place to find place names from Columbus's fourth voyage. Uh, here is a uh, a diagram, a map of Columbus's fourth voyage. So he was in Central America, uh, Cuba and Hispaniola. So nowhere uh, near south of the tropic. But if we, if we look at these place names, uh, so Puerto Seguro, they all come from Columbus's fourth voyage. Rio Belém, Curibaro, uh, the Mount, uh, Mountain of St. Christopher, this text, uh, Latin text here, which translates as, in this Gulf Corabaru, worms are born that bore through ships. So talking about shipworms, Columbus did in fact have damage from shipworms on his fourth voyage. And the river of the pine. 
So if it were just one or two place names that corresponded with Columbus's first fourth voyage, it might be a coincidence, but there's just too much, uh, too many place names from Columbus's fourth voyage for it to be a coincidence. So the question is, how on earth did these place names from Columbus's fourth voyage get so far to the south? How did they get mixed up with this southern continent? So on Roselli's map of 1508, place names from Columbus's fourth voyage appear in Eastern Asia. Columbus thought he was in Asia. There's a certain logic to that. But again, how do they become so far to the south on this anonymous map in the Vatican? Um, there's some very similar information as it happens on the Jagiellonian globe of circa 1510 in Krakow. Here's South America. Here's the Indian Ocean. And in the southern Indian Ocean, that is a, in a basically the same location as this peninsula, there's an island that is labeled America Novater Reperta or America Newly Discovered. So an island named America in the same position as this peninsula. So here's a closer look at the island. And it has, it, it comes close to a peninsula jutting south uh, from Asia. And if we put the Vatican map above the Agalonian globe, we can see again that the island on the globe is in basically the same position as the peninsula on the map. So these two things associated with the new world in the same location on these two objects. And the source, how is it, again, that this e information ended up so far to the south? Martin Waldseemuller, in his introduction to cosmography, has a passage that seems to locate America very far to the south. He says, in the sixth climate towards the Antarctic are located the farthest part of Africa, recently discovered, the islands of Zanzibar, the Lesser Java, and Siula, and the fourth part of the earth, which, because Amerigo discovered it, we may call Amerige, the land of Amerigo, so to speak, or America. So this passage seems to place America in the far south. And again, there's that peninsula. And finally, a quick look at the southern continent on Michel Tramezzino's map of 1554, which we see here. Again, we have a ring of land around the South Pole. So here's part of the ring. Here's the other part in the Western Hemisphere. So it's, again, not a complete land as we saw in Schoener's, not a complete ring as we saw in Schoener's globe. So very briefly, since I'm running out of time, uh, Macrobius, in his account of the world, talks about a collision of waters at the two poles. And I think that's part of what's going on here. And then also, Roger Bacon talks about collisions of waters at the two poles and has this very curious diagram, which we see in a manuscript of his at the British Library. And it's the South Pole on one end, the North Pole on the other. And the beginning of India and the beginning of Spain, so I'll rotate it. And what we have is a diagram about flow of water between the two poles. And Tramezzino's map seems designed to facilitate a flow of water between the two poles. So we have this break between North America and Asia perfectly aligned with this break between uh, the, the two parts of the southern continent. Uh, so, but is it really, could that just be a coincidence that we have Bacon with this diagram talking about this flow of water between the two poles, and we have Tramezzino seeming to depict something similar? Well, there's another coincidence, which is in the projection used by Tramezzino uh, with uh, parallel straight lines of latitude uh, that are equidistant, which is exactly the projection that Roger Bacon recommends for making a world map. So uh, I think that really seals the deal that what we're looking at here is influence of Roger Bacon, and thus the, the southern continent is connected with this idea of a flow of water between the poles. So a very quick look at, at three different depictions of a ring of land around the South Pole. And it's strange that we should have these objects that all depict this ring of land around the South Pole with open water at the pole, and yet there's not a very clear connection between the three of them. There's no clear chain of influence at all. So it's a very uh, puzzling uh, tradition, 
but it is part of the history of the mythical southern continent that we're looking at in this panel. Thank you very much. So on to our third paper by uh, Professor Koran Braga, who is from Babesh Bolyai University, if I say that correctly. And uh, his title is The Invention of Terra Australis Incognita. Uh, the microphone is yours. So thank you very much for inviting me here to come from the antipodes, quite. Um, you know, um, I'm coming from Cluj-Napoca in Transylvania, in Romania. This is in real geography. But in imaginary geography, I'm coming from Dracula land. So beware vampires. Um, what more? Um, I'm not a geographer nor, nor a historian. So maybe I'm landed in the wrong room, a conference room. Uh, I'm a comparatist. I'm working in comparative literature. And um, as a comparatist, I need different interdisciplinary uh, methodologies in order to better comprehend uh, ancient works, an ancient literature. So I make use of mythology, I make use of uh, theology, of uh, history of religions, but also of uh, psychoanalysis, or for example, of um, what the French school, uh, philosophical school, calls uh, recher recherche sur l'imaginaire, imagination studies. So this is how I came from literature to uh, human or humanistic geographies, to symbolic geographies more specifically, and to uh, uh, geographic imaginary. So I want to speak about the, also about uh, the Terra Australis Incognita. This is the title I prefer. Um, I don't know why. Um, uh, a topic that has been tackled already by my colleagues in, in these two marv uh, marvelous talks. Uh, so somehow I will overlap your explanation, but uh, I I'll skip this explanation you already heard. Where? So I'm not, uh, I, I'm passing be because the, 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 the Terra Australis Incognita was already introduced to you. I'm not insisting on it. I'll only show some uh, maps. For example, we have here uh, a map by uh, Rumol Mercator and other geog geographers of the 16th century, li like Abraham Ortelius or Gerardus Mercator, who represented this uh, big mass of land. The difference from the presentation of Chet is that I'm not uh, focusing on ring co on a ring continent, but on a compact mass of land. The in this kind of maps, the southern continent was represented as a, as a, a compact mass of land. Now, sorry about that. Uh, I said that I am comparatist, so I want also to show you that uh, this um, hypothetical, hypothetical continent was used by, uh, by uh, authors of uh, utopian voyages, of extraordinary voyages, in order to represent uh, peoples or to represent uh, utopian or dystopian places on the map of Mundi. So, for example, I am presenting you um, book by uh, Joseph Hall, Mundus Alteret Idem, uh, which was translated to another world and yet the same, in which the southern continent is uh, populated, is uh, organized in uh, four big countries. One is Lavernia, which would be the land of the thieves. Then we have Pamphagonia, which is uh, the land uh, of the gluttons, uh, leaded by uh, the big uh, duck, Cagastius. We have a land, Ivronia, of course, the land of drunkards. Also a big land of Moronia, the land of fools with different regions, uh, Felix uh, Moronia, uh, violent fools, etc., etc. And a third, a third a fifth uh, country, Viraginia, the land of women. Uh, maybe the most important part of this is Aphrodisia. Well, 
Aphrodite is, is the goddess of this land, but there is also uh, uh, Insula Hermaphroditica and other uh, places in which, as you can see, uh, Joseph Hall uh, places the most typical uh, scenes of the so society contemporary to him and his readers. Now, in early modernity, there were several uh, extraordinary and utopian, utopian voyages which made use of, the, of this hypothetical continent. I already cited Joseph Hall, but I could also cite Denis Veyraz, The History of the Sivarites of Sevarambi, which was translated to French as L'Histoire de Sevarambi. Uh, puis Gabriel de Fagny, La Terre Australe Connue, c'est-à-dire la description de ce pays inconnu jusqu'ici, et de ses mœurs et de ses coutumes. Puis uh, 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 an Italian uh, story, Viaggi di Enrico Vant in Alle Terre Incognito Australe, Al Paese delle Scimie, then Robert Paltok, The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins, then an anonymous Voyages, Travels and Wonderful Discoveries of Captain John Holmesby, James Byrne is a travels of Hildebrand Bauman, and, final, and uh, finally, Retif de la Breton, La Découverte Australe par un nom volant ou le dédal français. So there was an entire literature who was making use of this uh, hypothetical continent. Now, my question is, which were the geographic principles that generated the illusion of the existence of a giant southern continent? And Chet already tackled one of these uh, theories. Uh, I think there are two. In my analysis, there were two theoretical arguments inherited from ancient and medieval cartography. The first was the theory of the antipodes, and the second, the theory of the isthmuses, or the theory, the terrestrial theory. The theory of the antipodes, um, can be best explained by the model that Kratos of Malos uh, offered to antiquities. Uh, as you can see, the globe, the terrestrial globe, is represented as um, being parted into four quarters by uh, two circumscribing rivers, the ancient ocean from an, uh, the Homeric model and from the Mesopotami Mesopotamian uh, model. And in this model, as you can see, the, the globe is parted into four parts. The Oikumene, the known world, Africa, Asia, and Europe, occupies one quarter. On the opposite side, there are the antipodes, and they are really on the other side. But also, uh, this model designs uh, two other continents, symmetrical continents, those in inhabited by the Periochi and by the Antiochi, which will be translated as the antitones. Now, when this three-dimensional representational, here I have a uh, explanation in Marcianus Capella in his the seven, uh, seven Liberal Arts. When this uh, model was projected on, a uh, three-dimensional model was projected onto a B-dimensional model, it engendered the maps, the Macrabian maps that uh, Chet or already presented, in which we have this ocean which parts the north from the south. Uh, the Oikumene occupies the uh, uh, mid, uh, uh, half of the circle, and the other half was uh, attributed to uh, terra antipodum nobis incognita, to a land which is not known for us. Um, the Macrobian maps were adapted also to the TO maps of the Middle Ages, and what we have here is a TO map. Uh, it's a TO map because we have at the top the east. We have the representation of the known world of the Oikumene as a T. Uh, this is Europe, this is Africa, they are parted by the Mediterranean Sea, and then the Tanais, the Don uh, River. Uh, separating Europe from Asia and the Nile separating Africa from uh, Asia. But this is not uh, really a TO map because the known world does not occupy the whole disk of the world. It occupies only a half of the sphere and on the other half it is this uh, continental mass of land which are the antipodes. Nothing is known about them and as we know that horror vacuis 
uh, impelled these uh, geographers to, to fill in. Uh, there is a text who is only filling in uh, this continent unknown. The second argument is what uh, it is called the theory of the isthmuses or the, the terrestrial theory. Now, during late antiquity, there were two important theories about what is dominant in, uh, in, in the world, in nature, water or earth. And each of these hypotheses was uh, at the basis of two theories. I will shortly present the first theory as a, uh, how to say, as, as a for contrast to the theory of the isthmuses, which is the oce oceanic theory or the theory of the gulfs. It starts from the ancient model of the world offered by a Babylonian uh, tablet from the second millennium before our year, in which the uh, earth, the known earth, was represented as a disk uh, surrounded by water. And you can see uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates. In the middle is Babylonia. This is the most ancient model of the earth in which earth is represented as a disk surrounded by water. This one model was adapted uh, by Homer and uh, to Greek mythology and was also adopted by Eratosthenes, Posidonius, or Strabo, geographers who believed that the dominant element in the world was water. So the known world, Europe, Africa, and Asia, was an island in the middle of a surrounding mass of oceanic water. And although this oikumene was no longer represented as a disk, but as a parallelogram, which was called the uh, plumis, it continued to be envisaged as a sort of continental mass besieged by water. For example, in a reconstruction of, uh, <coughs> of the geography of Strabo, as you can see, the known world, which is represented rather as a parallelogram, is surrounded by mare exterum, and uh, the most important uh, seas, the Mediterranean Sea, and then the Caspian Sea, which was thought to communicate with the Mare Exterum, and also the uh, Arabian Gulf and the Persian Gulf were, are only gulfs in the inland from the exterior mass of water. Um, I can show you two maps, two TO maps. These are real, really TO maps in which this hypothesis is at work. As you can see, the world is represented as a smaller disk, the orbiculus, inside the larger disk, the orbis. This is a disk of water which surrounds the known world. It's a TO map. Here is the east. From the east, in the east is the terrestrial paradise with the four rivers which spring from the terrestrial paradise. Here we have the Mediterranean Sea, which parts Europe from Africa. The Tanais Don is parting Europe from Asia. Also the Nile, Africa from uh, Asia. So in this kind of maps, as you can see, the mass of land, the known land, is surrounded by water. I want to show you something very humorous, I would say. This is a model of uh, the, of the uh, terrestrial globe when uh, geographers from, um, philosophers from uh, the late Middle Ages try to transpose, to project the theory of the gulfs uh, on the three-dimensional representation of the Earth. And what is the result? The result is that dominant in the world is a sphere of waters. And the sphere of uh, Earth is a smaller sphere which is rather like a like an apple floating within the sphere of water. So the emerged part of the sphere of land is the oikumene. And in this kind of a model, the existence, the very existence of, uh, of uh, an antipodal continent uh, is impossible. What you see here, sorry, is a representation by reductio ad absurdum. This is a representation uh, showing that antipodes could not exist because they should be submerged. They should be underwater. Only the only part 
emerge from the water is the oikumena. Incidentally, um, this kind of argument was used by the fathers of the church who tried to explain and to demonstrate that Antipos does not exist. And for example, this, this is a, an illustration to St. Augustine in which we have the people inhabiting our world and the people who should inhabit the Antipodes, as it, it is seen, are, uh, let's say, uh, impossible because not only they live with the heads uh, towards the, the uh, dif in, in a different position, in a reverse position, but they also should uh, breathe not air, but water. They should be underwater. Five minutes, okay. Uh, just to finish with this uh, presentation of the oceanic theory, uh, when the oceanic theory was transposed to the, that was projected on the globe, it engendered models like this. Uh, you might think that this is a TO map. This is not a TO map because it is oriented to the north. And although it has all the characteristics of a TO map, you see the terrestrial paradise, the four rivers, inclusive the, the river Nile, who starts from the terrestrial paradise, and then Europe, Asia, and Africa. But this is not a TO map, a flat representation of the world as a disk. This is a three-dimensional representation in, in which what you s we see is a, a hemisphere of the world. It was called the hemisphere of land. What is on the other side of the sphere is a hemisphere of water. So in this model of the world, no antipodes. But the complementary ancient theory claimed that the mass of Earth was dominant in the world, while water was ma uh, merely filled the hollows of the terrestrial surface. It was a theory developed by Hipparchus, Crates, and Ptolemy, a theory that claimed that the three continents of the Oikumene were the extension of a large expanse of land covering the edges of the map. This is why it is called the theory of the isthmuses in reverse symmetry with the theory of gulfs. And the assumption that Earth supports the flat disk or the clamis explains one of, of the oddities. This is the second explanation I should offer, I could offer for the existence of the antipodes and of the terrestrial, uh, of the uh, unknown southern continent. Explains one of the oddities of Ptolemy's maps, which is the strip of land which unites South Africa with Southern Asia, transforming the Indian Ocean into an inner sea. This is a reconstruction of the uh, of a Ptolemaic map. And as you can see, uh, the hypothesis of the existence of an external expanse of land oblige uh, Ptolemy and his, uh, his uh, successor to unite South Africa to South Asia with a strip of land. It is noted um, Terra incognita secundu Ptolemei, and they continue to represent this kind of a strip of land, which uh, is the result of a theoretical hypothesis that that uh, Earth is dominant on I in nature. Um, this is another uh, map of the same uh, of the same uh, shape. I would also show you this strip of cartouches, of cartouche. Uh, why are they there? Well, they, they note the latitudes, the parallels, but I think that, um, you know, some kind of horror vacui, and but also the hypothesis that Earth is dominant in nature, oblige such geographers and sub, such authors of Mapa Mundi to, uh, not, not to let the external ocean finish the map, but to close the external ocean with something. It's an artificial device, but still water is only, how to say, it's only confined in the interior of the mass of land. Um, yeah, strange and uh, humorous thing. For example, Gregor Reich in his Margarita Philosophica, uh, evidently the, the uh, Portuguese have already discovered the way to India, 
So this um, strip of land could not be there, but he still continues to design, to, to draw this strip of land, writing hic non terra sed mare est. Here there is no land, but it is water. So the tradition obliged him, okay, obliged him to, to uh, continue to draw the strip of land. Well, when projected in the sphere, on the sphere, uh, this gave, the theory of the isthmus is gave birth of what is the standard representation of the Earth, the terraqueous or the terrestrial globe. Uh, as you know, this is a geoid. This would be the Earth without water. Pretty ugly as an image. Um, but this is the standard theory that uh, Copernicus, Galileo, and all, uh, and other Renaissance geographers uh, endorsed. One of the uh, last maps I want to present you is a map by Lopo Homem in which we uh, uh, see a, a, a prolongation and a deformation of the, strip of, of the Ptolemaic strip of land. Uh, as you can see, now Africa and is uh, finished with the Cape of Good Hope. The Indian Ocean is united with the Atlantic, but the strip of land is still here. And now it unites, unites Eastern Africa with South America. So from the presupposition that land is dominant in nature, uh, appeared, or this strip of land, as you can see, is circumdating uh, circum the whole uh, globe. And even if North America was, was not very well known, I think Florida was discovered. Uh, Verrazzano has already discovered some portions of the uh, Atlantic facade of the North America. But there's still some information in order for Lopo Homem also to enclose this part of the, I'm finished, this part of the, of the ocean with land. So I think these were the theories two theories, the theory anti of the antipodes and the uh, theory of the isthmuses with the strip Tole Ptolemaean strip of land, which engender this representation of the southern continent, a continent called, as you uh, have seen, Terra Magalanica, Ma Megalanica, Magellanica, uh, Terra Papagali, uh, Brasilia Regio, etc., etc. And as a conclusion, for 200 years, the illusion of the southern continent nourished the fantasies not only of geographers, but also of politicians, explorers, conquistadors, as well as authors of extraordinary and utopian voyages. The French vo geographer La Poplinière, for example, urged the French monarchs to compensate the huge colonial empire of the Spaniards by launching expeditions that would enable them to take possession of, of and colonize this France Austral deemed to be as large as the old world and the new world taken together. It was James Cook exploration voyages uh, which finally helped define the correct outline of the southern lands and put an end to the geographical chimera illusion of terra australis incognita. Okay, some bibliography, thank you. Okay, well, if I can invite uh, questions from the audience. Please, first question here. Yeah, this is Karen from British Museum. Yeah, I was curious about whether all three of you can speak about what's going on around the North Pole at this time. Um, I mean, yeah, that's the question. Um, well, I, I study a little bit about the North Pole, but really connected with well, had in common with the fifth part, just to prove that all the intellectual processes I was analyzing in connection to the fourth part and the fifth part wasn't an exception. But I tried to demonstrate that it was an, uh, an epistemological process and device to continue to imagine the unknown world. So um, I'm not uh, went to really in the sixth part but I found many references about the sixth part 
mm, connected to the first part, not isolated. It was also the the unknown that was really weird because it's much more understandable that the first part was invented on the basis of something real, and they reproduce. I haven't had time enough to explain how the first part had many other strategies that were mirrored from Europe and Asian and Europe on Africa, especially toponyms as a very well studied uh, topic. But um, on the basis of something that, that there was a lot of evidence and real information and was it's really curious that from something in existence it was created another an existent thing. So that was at least mm, in my research was mm, particularly interesting, not the rest of the geography geography of the sixth part. So yes, I, I have looked a little bit at the cartography of the North Pole, and uh, on one of the maps Carla showed there was a, a basically a ring of four islands around the North Pole, and uh, the map I was talking about yesterday, the Urbano Monte map, has uh, a ring of eight islands around the South Pole, but also the four islands around the North Pole. So there was certainly a, uh, an idea of symmetry operating there, and the, the, the four islands surrounding the North Pole appear also on Martin Betheim's globe and go back to a lost work called the Inventio Fortunata, which uh, a few different cartographers uh, make reference to, um, but we don't have the work itself. Well, just a uh, complementary, uh, how to say, idea. I think that this uh, representation of the North Pole with four islands and of the South Pole with a uh, ring of uh, eight islands uh, has given birth one or two centuries later lately to the the idea and to the model of the hollow earth mm -hmm. the hollow earth which is an is a, a hollow earth ha who has in its center a planet which is responsible for the uh, de deviation of the magnetic uh, how you call it and in order to have co to communicate these inner lands with the external, you have to have some uh, big uh, hollows of in the water and not in the land. Um, we already discussed with chat uh, this uh, hypothesis. Uh, it, could not, it could not be reversed. It would be anachronistically to say that uh, the hypothesis of the hollow earth gave birth to the idea of a ring continent. But uh, in the reverse order, maybe the theory of the of the hollow earth was supported by this representation of a ring continent. Um, there are other questions. Yes, please. Could you just could you introduce yourself? Thank you, uh, Tim Lockley, University of Warwick. Um, I wanted to ask Chet a question. This the idea of these rivers or big bodies of water connecting the poles. Um, did no one ever think? Well, it's really cold, and therefore, at least part of this water is going to be frozen and not flowing how they think it's going to flow. Um, it, it would certainly seem that that idea would have occurred, um, but and particularly given that we have these climatic mapamundi that show, you know, a torrid zone at the equator, temperate zones to the north and south, and then frigid zones explicitly so labeled uh, in the north and south poles. But at, at the same time that those diagrams existed, uh, cartographers were locating camels in their hypothetical southern continents and, and all sorts of other animals that, w of course, could not possibly survive in a climate that was in any way characterized as frigid. So uh, th there's a, a curious disconnect there. Thank you. I have a question here in the front. Okay, I have three questions. Um, <laughs> One for each. Uh, the, the for, for Carla, about um, you, you did mention the distinction between the category of island and the, the category of continent. As we know, for America, there was a sort of a fluid transition from island to continent. How about the, this, this fifth part of the world? Uh, was it ki did people come back with the idea that it might just be an island, or did it stay uh, stably a continent? Then I was wondering about the six cities and w 
why six? Because I would have thought seven would make sense because there's often this, this myth of the seven cities, uh, the lost seven cities and the Atlantic. W w but six is, is sort of where does that number come from? Um, and finally, um, according, I, I don't know if you've heard, there's an island um, that is now claiming the title of Land of the Morons. Um, it, used, it used to be part of Europe and it's now breaking away. <laughs> Well, um, the fifth part was from the beginning a continent because, um, for example, America in the Pastor Mueller book says that the America, the new world, well, he called America, was a new part but was an island. And that was a problem, a theoretical problem because that was a, a conceptual thing that had to be resolved. So that was resolved by mid 16th century, conceptualizing America as a continent. And when they changed the definition, it was an open definition because uh, uh, previously it was mm, a conceptual definition based on empirical basis. I mean, continents were uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And that was all, so that was, uh, it prevailed a negative definition because the other things uh, were have a lot of examples, but of continents, they used to have only three. There are some counter examples, but mostly uh, all the cosmographical books uh, agreed on that point. Continents, there were only three. When America demonstrated that it was huge, different, and it deserved to be considered a part because it was clearly, far away in many sense, empirical sense as well, from the old world. And the new definition of continent was quite open to say that if we discover a new land which separated by a body of water, that might be a continent. So that was a, a more abstract definition that allowed to increase many other continents and parts of the world. So that was a more operative way to describe our work, to design in an open sense, and to recognize a kind of um, um, division between the ancient, ancient knowledge of the world and the modern way of um, the world. So that was very epistemological in a sense. It was a, a very, um, way to think about new things, expecting things. And that was on the basis of theories. And, and navigation and new data was interpret, interpret on the basis of those theories and not just about the, like the surprise because the new world was a surprise and that implied a lot of theories and hypotheses and a lot of controversies for at least six decades until there was kind of consensus about there was a new part and that it should be called continents. So. Yes, the question of the, the cities in the southern continents is very intriguing. Um, where they might have come from on Roselli's map, I have no idea. And there's, as there's no names indicated, there's not much to, to go on. The, the six cities on the anonymous map in the Vatican I, I feel like I did everything in my power to try and come up with any source for those names for the cities, and I, I couldn't get anywhere. Uh, and if I recall correctly, there's a, a globe uh, called the Green Globe in the, the BNF. Um, it's very, as a southern continent, a ring continent, very similar to Schoener's. And if I recall correctly, it has a city in it as well, uh, but I'm not remembering uh, what the name of it might be. Uh, but if you're interested, that might be something else to poke around with. You know, the name of uh, Joseph Hall, Dystopia, was another word and yet the same. <laughs> so the, the Terra Australis Incognita is Europe, Moronia is England. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just to add something to Sultan. And when the new star standard classification of landmasses 
isms and peninsulas would subsume into the two main categories, island and continent. So by the end of 16th century, that, uh, that stable uh, classification was mm, just based on the opposition between island and continent. And then even in 19th century atlases, uh, national atlases, you can find a, a distinction between a list of countries in the continent and islands belonging to empires. We've had lots of questions from the front. Are there more questions in the front? I want to make sure we have our, our audience. I'll come back to you, uh, and I'll just, there's a speaker in the, in the back. Hello, this is Rhonda Debachi. I loved all of the talks, they were great. I knew about the symmetry theory, but I didn't know about any of those other ones, so those are all fantastic, and, I, and I've, I've, I've seen very little about the ring continents. You've talked about some of the, s of the place names, but ni none of you mentioned the only three that I know from the southern continent, Beach, Molitor, and Mukash, which are on the Mercator map, and I have been told that they are from Marco Polo. If any of you know any more about it, I'd love to know that. Uh, yeah, there, there's an article that traces the history of Mercator's southern continent uh, by, his last name is Richardson. And I would recommend uh, starting with that. I mean, I can if you send me an email, I'll send you the reference. I'll send you the article. Thank you so much. I'm sort of going to ask a question about northern geography that speaks to my own interests. I noticed on one of Carla's first slides there was um, about the old world, y Europe, Asia, Africa. It was Europe, Tataria, Asia, and I. And um, on the Strabo map, you know, they're just Europe, Asia. So I'd like to ask anyone to weigh in on the history of Tartaria. My understanding was that kind of Tatar is someone that Genghis Khan has conquered, but then gets extrapolated out to this people and region. So uh, could, could you tell me more about the history of Tartaria as a place appearing on maps? Is it a divide between Europe and Asia? Well. I can I can give a hint, but only for medieval maps, not for modern or early modern maps. Uh, on medieval maps, uh, this northern part of Asia was um, attributed to Gog and Magog, so to the the Dan people and the Savage and Anthropophagi people from uh, antique and then medieval mythology. And I can show you on this kind of maps, on the Teo maps. Tartaria would be here, and it is called the enclosed people. Uh, it is said that there is an ancient legend who said that uh, Alexander Mas of Macedonia, when he went to the west, uh, to the east, uh, he found uh, people so uh, violent and so savage that he had to enclose these people behind mountains. And these people were thought to come to Europe when they. Uh, when they could uh, break this wall of Alexander the Great. So every time that in Europe come the Huns, the, uh, the migrators, the until the, the Mongolians and the Tatar, it was said that the people of Gog and Magog had broken the, the, the wall of Alexander and now are coming to Europe to destroy the civilization. But this is antique maps or uh, uh, medieval maps, not um, early modern maps. Uh, I, I think it would be worth looking at Bald Simuler's Carta Marina. If I recall correctly, he actually indicates the border between Tartaria and other parts of Asia. Um, so it would be worth uh, having a look at. Um, well, I haven't paid uh, real attention on that because my question was about how to distinguish continents, and that was quite variable. For example, to divide it Asia from Africa, sometimes, as I said, all always bodies of water, but sometimes it was the Arabic Sea and sometimes the Nile. So it depends of the the river of the sea you take into account. 
Tataria could be on one side or, or the other. So that's what I can say. I should check it again, map my map, my map to have a, a proper reply to that. But I would say that the me what I was studying is about um, how the idea of continent be was con built up on the basis of where the limits should be traced. Other questions? Please, go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Lucas Scholz. Um, I, have, um, I have a question um, for, um, for, uh, for, for the last two speakers. I, I was intrigued by your mention of, um, of how the, um, the hollow ring theory um, fit well with notions of a hollow earth. Um, there's a surprisingly high number of people nowadays who, who believe in, in, in theories that, that say that the earth is hollow or flat or whatnot. And I was just wondering, um, do you see a potential for a renaissance of these kinds of ideas um, um, in, in, in this context? Do you see any, any of these ideas being taken up again and gaining traction on, uh, on, on, on Twitter, I suppose? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the theory of the hollow earth, uh, earth was um, devised by uh, Euler and Halley, which uh, at, the, at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th, and indeed it inspired a series of, uh, of extraordinary voyages within the Earth. Uh, I don't know, maybe the most famous is Casanova, uh, the uh, Le Vingt Jours de Isabeth Ico Sameron is the, n the name in, in, well in Greek rather than the an explore, exploring of the interior earth. And then I remember that there wa was a theory uh, which was uh, proposed to the, uh, to the American parliament that it even obtained some 16 votes for an exploration, a mission of exploration to the hollow earth through the uh, North Pole. And then um, it was written also uh, 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 an extraordinary voyage by Captain Symes, who uh, endorsed this kind of a theory. And then by the end of the century, of the 19th century, there, there was a, uh, I don't know, remember the name, a pastor who said that uh, in Florida, uh, near Flo uh, uh, Fort Myers is the center of the earth and that we are living in an interior world and all the uh, exterior uh, is only a representation, a mental representation. And I think also that was a, an American uh, captain, Captain Byrne, who organized two expeditions uh, before the, or during the, the Second World War to the north and to the south to find these hollows and this, uh, but uh, I don't know if uh, now it could be, it could become a very popular theory because of the vulgata of the representation of the world, which is the terrestrial, the terraqueous globe. I, I wonder if I may take the prerogative, since we have a couple of minutes left, to ask uh, a, a question actually of either of these speakers or the previous two. Um, I, for those of you who have looked around, there's this wonderful exhibition uh, that presents the maps that accompany the papers that we've just been listening to. Um, but if you really want to get a good sense of what those maps and what that exhibition is all about, I recommend that you have a look at the poster that's here, uh, because that poster has a short statement written by Professor Karen Jiggen, who's hiding a little bit here. Um, but it is a wonderful statement, because it clarifies everything that's going on here. And the first sentence that she has, I, you know, I th I've just checked to make sure I get it right, but it says, all maps are deeply imaginary acts. And I think that's what we've been seeing, right? And this is what this whole uh, two set of two days of papers is all about. These are, these are acts of fiction. These are creations of one kind or another. But while I'm, I've been listening to these five papers, it strikes me that actually no one is able to imagine something without being deeply influenced by something else, by drawing on 
ways of imagining and ways of representing styles and manners of imagining that are actually in some ways also acts of copying. And as historians, we're always, and as historians of various kinds, we're interested in origins and we're interested in tracing where something came from. And we've seen lots of examples of ways in which that comes back, you know, it goes back to this and that came, goes back to this. We've seen lots of ways of looking at it. So my question is, is there actually ever an act of imagination or is this all some way of reinventing or copying? Um, and I was, my, this was the question I wanted to ask actually of Erica because she most explicitly was looking at a kind of mutual back and forth of copying information. Really, there was no imagination going on there, really, right? So I just wondered if anyone wants to speak to that relationship between copying and reinventing and imagining. <laughs> you don't have to answer. You were just <laughs> resting there. But <laughs> <laughs> does anyone want to speak to that? Yeah. Well, I think that imagination is um, it implies all of all. Or intellectual processes is a way of coping, is a way to think, is a way to rethink, is a way to invent. Because imagination, I guess, is the more umbrella concept, is something that is uh, um, unavoidable, is the way that human beings are dealing with the rest of the world. Um, normally, it's a, it's a word connected with fiction, but I think that especially in cartography, it's not exactly that. It's not a synonym from a real, inexistent imagination. It's, uh, it's the impulse to create and to, to imagine re really um, how the world is. So um, I could switch a little bit into a positive um, connotation for imagination and imaginary as a creative process, as many others that human beings need to create to live in the world. You don't have to speak to me. Oh, well, how are you on time? Okay. Um, <coughs> you know, philosophers, uh, contemporary philosophers su such as uh, Nelson Goodman say that um, the construction of fictional words is an activity of word making, which implies a series of, proc uh, of procedures such as decomposition, recomposition, etc., etc. So, a fantastic geography is also a, a, a work of imagination in which uh, uh, elements taken from uh, real geography, from uh, empirical geography, are recombined in a new representation of space. What is different is the criteria which are governing the symbolic maps in, dif uh, in contrast to, uh, let's say, geographical uh, empirical maps. Uh, these principles in fantastic and imaginary maps are non-empirical. They, they may be theological, they may be mythological, they may be psychoanalytical, ideological, but uh, only a small part of them are organized by a empirical uh, verification of the data, and uh, most of these for example, why on these uh, TO maps, which is the center of the world? It's Jerusalem. And this is a theological argument and non, not an empirical argument. Okay, well, okay, I wait, 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 wait. Oh, <laughs> another comment. <laughs> and thank you so much for the point. Um, and I. On Valentine's Day, that eagle song, she can't take you anywhere, you don't already know how to go, right? <laughs> uh, but I think that what the point you make has been informing my pedagogy a lot because whether it's empirical or not, the, um, I read some things about learning. Like we only learn by hooking on to a framework we already have. It's why I've kind of like been kicking it old school in terms of you need to know facts. This sort of idea of like you can only think. Well, d we're just here to th learn how to think doesn't really fly because you we learn by hooking things on. And it seems like whether it's empirical or imaginative, but there's some sort of communal idea that all of these things hook, add, and extend. So it's sort of just reiterating what you said, I think. I, I think we've had some stimulating <laughs> papers that, that show lots of different ways of imagining and making up things that we don't know, whereby the unknown 
becomes known in one way or another. So we'll call it to a halt there, but there is much to continue, particularly our keynote speaker. But before we reach that, we have some time to go downstairs and to enjoy a reception. That's so right. Before we do that, actually, let's just thank our speaker. Yes, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> well done.